Welcome to the unit Introduction to Textiles, Arts and Crafts. This unit introduces you to the world of textile arts and crafts and traces its history through fascinating materials. By the end of this unit, students will be able to describe the development of textile arts and crafts, identify the classification of textile arts and crafts, list the techniques of textile arts and crafts, examine examples of textile arts and crafts. The first module gives an overview of textile arts and crafts. Textiles have been a fundamental part of human life since the beginning of the civilization. The methods and materials used to make them have expanded enormously while the functions of textiles have remained the same. From early times, textiles have been used to cover the human body, protect it from the elements and send social cues to other people to store, secure and protect possessions and to soften, insulate, decorate living spaces and surfaces. The textile term is derived from the Latin word texe that means to weave. It originally refers only to woven fabrics. It has however come to include fabrics produced by other methods. Thus, threads, cords, ropes, braids, lace, embroidery, nets, fabrics made by weaving, knitting, bonding, felting or tufting are textiles. Textiles are commonly associated with clothing and soft furnishings and association that accounts for the great emphasis on style and design in textiles. These consume a large portion of total industry production. A textile or cloth is a flexible woven material consisting of a network of natural or artificial fibers often referred to as thread or yarn. Yarn is produced by spinning raw fibers of wool, flax, cotton or other material to produce long strands. Textiles are formed by weaving, knitting, crocheting, knotting or pressing fibers together which is also called as felting. The words fabric and cloth are used in textile assembly trades such as tailoring and dressmaking as synonyms for textile. However, there are subtle differences in these terms in specialized usage. Textile refers to any material made of interlacing fibers. Fabric refers to any material made through weaving, knitting, spreading, crocheting or bonding that may be used in production of further goods like garments etc. Cloth may be used synonymously with fabric but often refers to a finished piece of fabric used for a specific purpose for example table cloth. The term fabric is derived from the Latin term fabrica meaning fabric or workshop. It means that which is put together like fabric or building. In fabric engineering, fabric is defined as a flat material with length, breadth, thickness and having weight. While volumetric density of fabric can be determined from these parameters, it is customary to evaluate the aerial density of fabric in terms of ounce 
per square yard or GSM that is grams per square meter. The word cloth derives from the old English word clad meaning a cloth woven or felted material to wrap around one which is also derived from the Proto-Germanic word kalithas. There are several different types of fabrics from two main sources, man-made and natural. Inside natural, there are two others, namely plant and animal. Some examples of animal-based textiles are silk and wool. An example of a plant textile is cotton. The production of textiles is an ancient craft, but today the speed and scale of production in textiles has changed beyond recognition from those ancient crafts by mass production and the introduction of modern manufacturing techniques. Textiles are all around us in our everyday life. Some of its uses include clothing, bags, furnishings, geotextiles and carpets. In the 20th century, these were supplemented by artificial fibers made from petroleum. Textiles are made in various strengths and degrees of durability from the finest grossomere to the sturdiest canvases. The relative thickness of fibers in cloth is measured in counts such as tex and denier as units in direct count system and in indirect count system English count as an unit. The process from the material to a textile can be broken down into harvest or shearing of wool fiber, carding and spinning into threads, process the threads into a cloth, make the upholstery or garment. Textiles can be made from many materials. These materials come from four main sources animal, wool or silk, plant, cotton, flax, jute, minerals, asbestos and glass fibers, and synthetic such as nylon, polyester and acrylics. In the past, all textiles were made from natural fibers including plant, animal and mineral sources. Animal-based textiles are commonly made from hair, fur, skin or silk. Wool refers to the hair of the domestic goat or sheep which is distinguished from other types of animal hair. Each individual strand of hair are coated with scales and tightly crimped. The wool as a whole is coated with a wax mixture known as lanolin, also commonly known as wool grease, which is waterproof and dirt proof. The term woolen refers to a bulkier yarn produced from carded, non-parallel fiber, while worsted refers to a finer yarn spun from longer fibers which have been combed to be parallel. Wool is commonly used for warm clothing. Cashmere, the hair of the Indian cashmere goat and mohair, the hair of the North African angora goat are types of wool known for their softness. Other animal textiles which are made from hair or fur are alpaca wool, vicuna wool, llama wool and camel hair generally used in the production of coats, jackets, ponchos, blankets and other warm coverings. Angora refers to the long, thick, soft hair of the Angora rabbit. 
equivute is the finer inner wool of the musk ox. Vatmal is a coarse cloth made of wool produced in Scandinavia mostly around 1000 to 1500 CE. Silk is an animal textile made from the fibers of the cocoon of the Chinese silkworm which is spun into a smooth fabric prized for its softness. There are two main types of the silk, mulberry silk produced by the Bombix mori and wild silk such as tassa, muga, eri, etc. Silkworm larvae produce the first type if cultivated in habitats with fresh mulberry leaves for consumption while tassa silk is produced by silkworms feeding purely on oak leaves. Around four-fifths of the world's silk production consists of cultivated silk. Grass, rush, hemp and sisal are all used in making ropes. In the first two, the entire plant is used for this purpose while in the last two, only fibers from the plant are utilized. Coir, which is extracted from coconut fiber, is used in making twine and also used in floor mats, door mats, brushes, mattresses, floor tiles and sacking. Straw and bamboo are both used to make hats. Straw, which is a dried form of grass, is also used for stuffing as in kapok fibers. Fibers from pulpwood trees, cotton, rice, hemp and nettle are used in making paper. Cotton, flax, jute, hemp, modal and even bamboo fibers are all used in clothing. Pina, which is pineapple fiber and rami are also fibers used in clothing generally with a blend of other fibers such as cotton. Nettles have also been used to make a fiber and fabric very similar to hemp or flax. The use of milkweed stock fiber is used but it tends to be weaker than other fibers like hemp of flax. Acetate is used to increase the shininess of certain fabrics such as silks, velvets and taffetas. Seaweed is used in the production of textiles. A water soluble fiber known as alginate is produced and is used as a holding fiber when the cloth is finished. The alginate is dissolved, leaving an open area. Lyocell is a man-made fabric derived from wood pulp. It is often described as a man-made silk equivalent. It is a tough fabric that is often blended with other fabrics such as cotton. Fibers from the stalks of plants such as hemp, flax and nettles are also known as bast fibers. Asbestos and basalt fibers are often used for vinyl tiles, sheeting, adhesives, transite panels, siding, acoustical ceilings, stage curtains and fire blankets. Glass fiber is used in the production of spacesuits, ironing board, and mattress covers, ropes and cables, reinforcement fibers for composite materials, insect nettings, flame retardant and protective fabric, soundproofing, fireproofing and insulating fibers. Metal fibers, metal foils and metal wires have variety of uses 
such as the production of jewelries. Hardware cloth, which is a US term only, is a coarsely woven mesh of steel wire used in construction. It is much like standard window screening but heavier and with a more open weave. It is sometimes used together with screening on the lower part of screen doors to resist scratching by dogs. It serves similar purposes as chicken wire such as fences for poultries and traps for animal control. All synthetic textiles are used primarily in the production of clothing. Polyester fiber is used in all types of clothing either alone or blended with fibers such as cotton. Aramid fiber is used for flame retardant clothing, cut protection and armor. Acrylic is a fiber used to imitate wools including cashmere and is often used in replacement of them. Nylon is a fiber used to imitate silk. It is used in the production of pantyhose. Thicker nylon fibers are used in rope and outdoor clothing. Spandex, trade name Lycra, is a polyurethane product that can be made tight fitting without impending movement. It is used to make active wear, bras and swimsuits. Olefin fiber is a fiber used in active wear, linings and warm clothing. Olefins are hydrophobic allowing them to dry quickly. A sintered felt of olefin fibers is sold under the trade name Tyvek. Ingeo is a polylactide fiber blended with other fibers such as cotton and used in clothing. It is more hydrophilic than most other synthetics allowing it to wick away perspiration. Lurex is a metallic fiber used in clothing embellishment. Milk proteins have also been used to create synthetic fabric. Milk or casein fiber cloth was developed during World War I in Germany and further developed in Italy and America during the 1930s. Milk fiber fabric is not very durable and wrinkles easily but has a pH similar to human skin and possesses antibacterial properties. It is marketed as a biodegradable, renewable synthetic fiber. Carbon fiber is mostly used in composite materials together with resin such as carbon fiber reinforced plastic. The fibers are made from polymer fibers through carbonization. From consumers viewpoints, fabrics are classified as 1. Apparel 2. Household 3. Industrial which is modified as apparel, outerwear, innerwear, seasonal wear, staple wear, fancy wear, household, wedding, home textiles, industrial textiles, mobile textiles, geotextiles, construction textiles, industrial textiles, medical textiles, safety textiles, smart or intelligent textiles, high altitude textiles, mountaineering textiles, outer space textiles, military textiles, agriculture textiles, horticulture textiles, sericulture textiles, dairy textiles, fishery textiles, etc. Methods of manufacturing fabrics 
are under woven, hand loom and par loom, knitted textiles, hand knitted, machine knitted, warp knits and weft knits, embroidered textiles, hand embroidery, machine embroidery, lace, handmade and machine made. Braided textiles, personal wear, industrial, oceanic wear, crochet, tatting, knotting, netting, and felting, fabric processing and finishing. Under fabric processing and finishing, there are two categories. One is gray fabric or loom state. Second category is the finished fabric in which scarred, bleached, dyed, printed, mercerized, stentored, calendared, sanforized, zero zero finished, sized, glazed, etched or embossed, felted, raised, Sheared, singed, fireproofed, soil resistant, soil release, stain resistant, anti crease, etc. Material used as natural, man made, or blends. Yarns used as filament and spun. Following are some trade name or brand names of fabrics such as poplin, shirting, cambric, lawn, voile, crepe, jean, denim, gabardine, sheeting, long cloth, twill, drill, tassar, mull, muslin, the mask, brocade, georgette, Satin, plain, flannel, blanket, rug, broadcloth, duck, canvas, velvet, corduroy, tarling, and Turkish tarling fabrics. From standards viewpoint as construction, weight, strength, condition, application, or end use. It may be noted that there is the possibility of overlapping of characteristics under the different methods of classification of fabrics. At present, customers are carried away by aesthetic sense involving look, color, feel, etc. and ultimately cost of fabric. In the present, Intrinsic quality of fabric is emphasized, leading to durability. Accordingly, fabrics are classified under the following categories. Fabric weight, average count, cover factor, fabric factor, weight factor ratio, fabric thickness, effective length, unit weight of fabric. Sewing threads are tightly twisted ply yarns made with strands having equally balanced twist producing a circular cross section. Thread for use in commercial or home sewing machines and for hand sewing should allow easy movement when tension is applied and ease in needle threading. It should be smooth to resist friction during sewing should have sufficient elasticity to avoid the breaking of stitches or puckering of seams and should have sufficient strength to hold seams during laundering or dry cleaning and in use. Thread size is frequently indicated on the spool end and systems for indicating degree of finesse 
may vary according to the textile measurement system used locally. Threads for special uses may require appropriate treatment. Garments made of water repellent fabrics, for example, may be sewn with thread that has also been made with water repellent. Threads are usually subjected to special treatments after spinning and is then wound on spools. Silk thread has great elasticity and strength combined with fine diameter. It can be permanently stretched in sewing and is suitable for silks and wools. Buttonhole twist is a strong, luxurious silk about three times the diameter of normal sewing silk and is used for handworked buttonholes for sewing on buttons and for various decorative effects. Cotton thread is compatible with fabric made from yarn of plant origin such as cotton and linen and for rayon made from a plant substance because it has similar shrinkage characteristics. It is not suitable for most synthetics which do not shrink or for fabrics treated to reduce shrinkage. Its low stretch is useful for woven fabrics but not for knits which require more stretch. Nylon thread is strong with great stretch and recovery does not shrink and is suitable for shears and for very stretchy knits. Polyester thread has similar characteristics and is appropriate for various synthetic and pre shrunk fabrics and for knits made of synthetic yarns. The process of bringing the fibers to a fabric include crochet, knitting, lace, felt and weaving. These processes are also part of the decoration and handle of the fabric. In crafts, art and design, the decoration of textiles is a major area as well as including the processes of making such as batik embroidery and print. Fiber art uses all these processes to push boundaries into art and sculptural work. Embroidery can be hand or machine stitch and is a way of decorating fabric or materials using a needle and thread or yarn. It can stitch other materials like beads of found objects into the work. Stitches such as blanket stitch, running stitch, cross stitch are just a few of the numerous types of stitches which can be used. Lace is an open work fabric patterned with open holes in the work made by machine or by hand. Types of lace include needle, crochet, bobbin and open work lace. Lace can be made with cotton, linen, gold, silk and metal wire. Print is the process of applying color to fabric. Thickened dyes are used to print using wooden blocks, stencils, engraved plates and silk screens onto the fabric. Felt is a non-woven fabric that is produced by wet or needle felting. Weaving two sets of threads on a loom, the warp and the weft interlock to make fabric. Knit can be made by machine or hand. The thread passes through a loop eventually building to make a garment etc. Yarn or knit bombing is a bit like graffiti with trees and buildings covered in knit. Batik 
is a cloth that traditionally uses a manual wax resist dyeing technique. The cloth is drawn on with a brush or chanting using hot wax and then cold dyed. The simplest of textile arts is felting in which animal fibers are matted together using heat and moisture. Most textile arts begin with twisting or spinning and plying fibers to make yarn or called thread when it is very fine and rope when it is very heavy. The yarn is then knotted, looped, braided or woven to make flexible fabric or cloth and cloth can be used to make clothing and soft furnishings. All of these items, felt, yarn, fabric and finished objects are collectively referred to as textiles. The textile arts also include those techniques which are used to embellish or decorative textiles, dyeing and printing to add color and pattern embroidery and other types of needlework, tablet weaving and lace making. Construction methods such as sewing, knitting, crochet and tailoring as well as the tools employed such as looms and sewing needles, techniques employed such as quilting and pleating and the objects made such as carpets, hooked rugs and coverlets all fall under the category of textile arts. Textile arts are those arts and crafts that use plant, animal or synthetic fibers to construct practical or decorative objects. Textiles have been a fundamental part of human life since the beginning of civilization and the methods and materials used to make them have expanded enormously while the functions of textiles have remained the same. The history of textile arts is also the history of international trade. The persistence of ancient textile arts and functions and their elaboration for decorative effect can be seen in a Jacobin era portrait of Hendrik Frederick, Prince of Wales by Robert Peake the Elder. The Prince's Capitan hat is made of felt using the most basic of textile techniques. His clothing is made of woven cloth, richly embroidered in silk and his stockings unknitted. He stands on an oriental rug of wool which softens and warms the floor and heavy curtains both decorate the room and block cold drafts from the window. Gold work embroidery on the tablecloth and curtains proclaim the status of the home's owner in the same way that the felted fur hat sheer linen shirt, trimmed with reticella lace and opulent embroidery on the prince's clothes proclaim his social. Traditionally, the term art was used to refer to any skill or mastery, a concept which altered during the Romantic period of the 19th century when art came to be seen as a specific faculty of the human mind to be classified with religion and science. This distinction between craft and fine art is applied to the textile arts as well, where the term fiber art or textile art is now used to describe textile-based decorative objects which are not intended for practical use. 
fashion designers commonly rely on textile designs to set their fashion collections apart from others. Armani, the late Gianni Versace and Emilio Pucci can be easily recognized by the signature print driven designs. Arts and crafts movement, English aesthetic movement of the second half of the 19th century that represented the beginning of a new appreciation of the decorative arts throughout Europe. By 1860, a vocal minority had become profoundly disturbed by the level to which style, craftsmanship and public taste had sunk in the wake of the Industrial Revolution and its mass-produced and banal decorative arts. Among them was the English reformer, poet and designer William Morris, who in 1861 founded a firm of interior decorators and manufacturers, Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Company. After 1875, Morris and Company dedicated to recapturing the spirit and quality of medieval craftsmanship. William Morris and his associates produced handcrafted metalwork, jewelry, wallpaper, textiles, furniture and books. The firm was run as an artist's collaborative with the painters providing the designs for skilled craftsmen to produce. To this day, many of their designs are copied by designers and furniture manufacturers. By the 1880s, William Morris's efforts had widened the appeal of the arts and crafts movement to a new generation. In 1882, the English architect and designer Arthur H. McMurdo helped organize the Century Guild for Craftsmen, one of the several such groups established about this time. These men revived the art of hand painting and championed the idea that there was no meaningful difference between the fine and decorative arts. Many converts both from professional artist ranks and from among the intellectual class as a whole helped spread the ideas of the movement. The main controversy raised by the movement was its practicality in the modern world. The progressives claimed that the movement was trying to turn back the clock and that it could not be done and the arts and crafts movement could not be taken as practical in mass urban and industrialized society. On the other hand, a reviewer who criticized an 1893 exhibition as the work of a few for the few also realized that it represented a graphic protest against design as a marketable affair controlled by the salesman and the advertiser and at the mercy of every passing fashion. In the 1890, approval of the arts and crafts movement widened and the movement became diffused and less specifically identified with a small group of people. Its ideas spread to other countries and became identified with the growing international interest in design, specifically with Art Nouveau. Contemporary fiber or textile artists use a wide range of processes such as weaving, needlework, paper making, leather work and so forth. These can be done by hand or aided by machines. They may also use many processes for preparing fibers or finished textiles such as carding, spinning, dyeing, finishing and bleaching. 
Finally, the fiber works or textiles may be painted, silk screened, treated with photographic chemicals, scorched or otherwise modified. No material is off limits for artists who may use any of thousands of animal, vegetable or synthetic materials in their work. They gather materials such as weeds, vines or animal hair from the outdoors or purchase products from suppliers who may have altered them by treating them with oils, fragrances, dyes, paints or pesticides. Imported animal or vegetable materials that have been processed to eliminate disease carrying insects, spores or fungi are also used. Old rags, bones, feathers, wood, plastics or glass are among many other materials incorporated in fiber crafts. Here are some descriptions of important processes. Basketry is the making of baskets, bags, mats, etc. by hand weaving, plating and coiling techniques using materials such as reeds, cane and sisal fiber. Knives and scissors are often used and coiled baskets are often sewed together. Batik involves the creating of dye patterns on fabric by applying molten wax to the fabric with a janting to form a resist, dyeing the fabric and removing the wax with solvents or by ironing between newsprints. Crocheting is similar to knitting except that a hook is used to loop threads into the fabric. Embroidery is the embellishment of a fabric, leather, paper or other materials by sewing of designs worked in thread with a needle. Quilting comes under this category. Knitting is the craft of forming a fabric by interlocking of yarn in a series of connected loops using long hand or mechanized needles. Lace making involves the production of ornamental open work of threads that have been twisted, looped and intertwined to form patterns. This can involve very fine and intricate hand stitching. Leather work crafts involve two basic steps, cutting, carving, sewing and other physical processes and the cementing, dyeing and finishing the leather. The first can involve a variety of tools. The latter can involve the use of solvents, dyes and lacquers for tanning. Macrame is the ornamental knotting of yarns into bags, wall hangings or similar materials. Weaving uses a machine called a loom to combine two sets of yarns, the warp and the weft, to produce a fabric. The warp is worn on large reels called beams which run the length of the loom. The warp yarns are threaded through the loom to form vertical parallel threads. The weft is fed from the side of the loom by bobbins. The loom shuttle carries the weft yarns across the loom horizontally under and above alternate warp threads. A starch sizing is used to produce threads from breaking during weaving. There are many types of looms both hand operated and mechanical. Dyeing Yarn or fabric can be dyed using a variety of types of dyes like natural, direct, acid, basic, disperse, fiber, reactive and others depending on the type of the fabric. Many dyeing processes 
involve heating the dye bath to near boiling. Many dyeing assistants can be used including acids, alkalis, salts, sodium hydrosulfite and in the case of natural dyes, mordants such as urea, ammonium dichromate, ammonia, copper sulfate and ferrous sulfate. Dyes are usually purchased in powder form. Some dyes may contain solvents also. Bleaching Fabrics can be bleached with chlorine bleaches to remove color. There are many potential health hazards in fiber or textile arts as in any workplace which includes air pollutants such as dust, gases, fumes and vapors that are inherent in the materials or are produced during the work processes and can be inhaled or affect the skin. In addition to chemical hazards of dyes, paints, acids, alkalis, moth proofing agents and so on, fiber or textile materials may be contaminated with biological materials that can cause diseases. Physical Effects of Working with Fibers and Textiles The physical characteristics of materials may affect the user. Rough, thorny or abrasive materials can cut or abrade skin. Much of fiber or fabric work is done while the worker is seated for prolonged periods and involves repetitive motions of arms, wrists, hands and fingers and often the entire body. This may cause severe pain and eventually repetitive strain injuries. Weavers for example can develop back problems, carpal tunnel syndrome, skeletal deformations from weaving in a squatting position on older types of looms, hand and finger disorders from threading and tying knots and eye strains from poor lighting. Many of the same problems can occur in other fiber crafts involving sewing, tying knots, knitting and so forth. Needlework crafts can also involve hazards of needle pricks. Precautions As with all work, the adverse effects depends on the amount of time spent working on a project each day, the number of work days, weeks or years, the quantity of work and the nature of workplace and the type of work itself. Other factors such as ventilation and lighting also affect the health of the artist or craftsperson. 1. A 2 hours a week spent at a loom in a dusty environment may not affect a person seriously unless that person is highly allergic to dust but a prolonged period of work in the same environment over months or years may result in some health effects. Generally, for prolonged or regular work in fiber art or textiles, obtain and use only treated or fumigated animal or vegetable materials. Other materials should be cleaned or washed and stored in closed containers to minimize dusts. Damp mop or wipe work area surfaces frequently. In many countries, manufacturers are required to provide information that describes the hazardous aspects of chemicals such as dyes, adhesives, paints or solvents in any products purchased such as a manufacturer's material safety data sheet requests such information. Avoid eating, drinking or smoking in the work area. Take frequent rest and exercise periods when work involves repetitive motions. Modify work processes to reduce the need 
for excessive lifting or straining. Use exhaust ventilation for regular or prolonged use of dusty materials, spray painting, heating of wax or work with solvents containing materials such as oil based paints or permanent ink markers. Avoid boiling acids and alkalis if possible. Wear gloves, goggles, face shields and protective aprons. Remember that dusts, gases and vapors travel throughout buildings and may affect others present, particularly infants, children and aged and the chronically ill. Consult an industrial hygienist or safety and health professional when planning a production workshop. History of Textiles The earliest form of textiles were nets produced from one thread and employed in a single repeated movement to form loops and basketry. The interlacing of flexible reeds, cane or other suitable materials. The production of net, also called limited thread work, was practiced in many ancient cultures. Examples of prehistoric textiles are extremely rare because of the perishable nature of fabrics. The earliest evidence of weaving closely related to basketry dates from Neolithic cultures of about 5000 BCE. Weaving preceded spinning of yarn, woven fabrics probably originated from basket weaving. Cotton, silk, wool and flax fibers were used as textile materials in ancient Egypt. Cotton was used in India by 3000 BCE and silk production is mentioned in Chinese chronicles dating to about the same period. The discovery of cloth fragments, terracotta spindles and bronze needles at Mohenjo-daro dating between 2500 and 1500 BCE indicates the antiquity of weaving, dyeing and patterning on fabrics in the Indian subcontinent. The earliest fabrics excavated display striking beauty and sophistication in terms of their design and art forms in a wide range of patterns and colors from different parts of the world and bear distinct local features. Yarns and cloth were dyed and printed from very early times. Specimens of dyed fabrics have been found in Roman ruins of the 2nd century BCE. Tie and dye effects decorated on the silks of China from the Tang dynasty and there is ample evidence of production of woven and printed textiles in India dating the 4th century BCE. Textiles found in Egypt also indicate a highly developed weaving craft from the 4th century with many tapestries made from linen and wool. Between the 5th and 7th century, Indian textiles had achieved a degree of refinement as seen in numerous Ajanta frescoes that features the resist techniques of printing tie-dye, ikat, and brocade weaving. By the early Middle Ages, some Turkish tribes were skilled in the manufacture of carpets, felted cloths, towels, and rugs. Lyons in France had a thriving silk weaving industry by the 8th century. Many areas in UK and France between the 12th and 14th century specialized in textiles woven with wool. From early times, textiles have been used to cover the human body 
and protect it from the elements, to send social cues to other people, to store, to secure and to protect possessions and to soften, insulate and decorate living areas and surfaces. The development of textile and clothing manufacture in prehistory has been the subject of a number of scholarly studies since the late 20th century. These sources have helped to provide a coherent history of these prehistoric developments. Evidence suggests that human beings may have begun wearing clothing as far back as 100,000 to 500,000 years ago. Genetic analysis suggests that the human body loves which lives in clothing may only have diverged from the head louse some 107,000 years ago, which supposed evidence that human began wearing clothing at around this time. These estimates predate the first known human exodus from Africa, although species of Homo, other than Homo sapiens, who may have worn clothes and shared these louse infestations, appear to have migrated earlier. Possible sewing needles have been dated to around 40,000 years ago. The earliest definite examples of needles originate from the Solutrean culture which existed in France from 19,000 BC to 15,000 BC. The earliest dyed flax fibers have been found in a prehistoric cave in the Republic of Georgia and date back to 36,000 BC. The earliest evidence of weaving comes from impressions of textiles and basketry and nets on little pieces of hard clay dating from 27,000 years ago and found in Dolini Vestonis in the Czech Republic. At a slightly later date, 25,000 years, the Venus figurines were depicted with clothing. Those from Western Europe were adorned with basket hats or caps, belts worn at the waist and a strap of cloth that wrapped around the body right above the breasts. Eastern European figurines wore belts hung low on the hips and sometimes string skirts. Archaeologists have discovered artifacts from the same period that appear to have been used in the textile arts 5000 BC, net gorges, spindle needles and weaving sticks. The first actual textile as opposed to skins sewn together was probably felt. Surviving examples of nail binding, another early textile method, date from 6500 BC. Our knowledge of ancient textiles and clothing has expanded in the recent past thanks to modern technological developments. Our knowledge of cultures varies greatly with the climatic conditions to which archaeological deposits are exposed, the Middle East and the arid figurines of China have provided many early samples in good condition. But the early development of textiles in the Indian subcontinent, sub-Saharan Africa and other moist parts of the world remains unclear. In northern Eurasia, peat box can also preserve textiles very well. Early woven clothing was often made of full loom widths draped, tied or pinned in place. The wearing of clothing is exclusively a human characteristic and is a feature of most human societies. It is unknown when humans began wearing clothes. Anthropologists 
believed that animal skins and vegetations were adopted into coverings as protection from cold, heat and rain, especially as humans migrated to new climates. Alternatively, coverings may have been invented first for other purposes such as magic, decoration, cult or prestige. These were later found to be practical as well. Clothing and textiles have been important in human history and reflect the materials available to a civilization as well as the technologies that it had mastered. The social significance of the finished product reflects their culture. Textiles defined as felt or spun fibers made into yarn were later netted, looped, knit or woven to make fabrics. These appeared in the Middle East during the Late Stone Age. From ancient times to the present day, methods of textile production have continuously evolved and the choices of textiles available have influenced how people carried their possessions, clothed themselves and decorated their surroundings. Sources available for the study of the history of clothing and textiles include material remains discovered via archaeology, representation of textiles and their manufacture in art and documents concerning the manufacture, acquisition, use and trade of fabrics, tools and finished garments. Scholarship of textile history especially its earlier stages, is part of material culture studies. Tyrian purple dye was an important trade good in the ancient Mediterranean. The Silk Road brought Chinese silk to India, Africa and Europe. Taste for imported luxury fabrics led to sumptuary laws during the Middle Ages and Renaissance. The discovery of dyed flax fibers in a cave in the Republic of Georgia dated to 34,000 BCE suggests textile-like materials were made even in prehistoric times. The production of textiles is a craft whose speed and scale of production has been altered almost beyond recognition by industrialization and the introduction of modern manufacturing techniques. However, for the main types of textiles, plain weave, twill weave or satin weave, there is little difference between the ancient and modern methods. Incas have been crafting keepers made of fibers either from a protein such as spun and plied thread like wool or hair from camelids such as alpacas, llamas and camels or from a cellulose like cotton for thousands of years. Keepers are a series of knots along pieces of string. Until recently, they were thought to have been only a method of accounting but new evidence discovered by Harvard professor Gary Urton indicates there are many more to the kipu than just numbers. Preservation of kipus found in museum and archive collections follow general textile preservation principles and practices. During the 15th century, textiles were the largest single industry. Before the 15th century, textiles were produced only in a few towns. But later, they shifted into districts like East Anglia and the Cotswolds. Many fabrics produced by the simple early weaving procedures are of striking beauty and sophistication. Design and art forms are of great interest and the range of patterns and colors is wide 
with patterns produced in different parts of the world showing distinctive local features. Yarns and cloth were dyed and printed from very early times. Specimens of dyed fabrics have been found in Roman ruins of the 2nd century BCE. Tie and dye effects decorated the silks of China in the Tang dynasty 618 to 1907 CE. And there is evidence of production of printed textiles in India during the 4th century BCE. Textiles found in Egypt also indicate a highly developed weaving craft by the 4th century CE with many tapestries made from linen and wool. Persian textiles of very ancient origin include materials ranging from simple fabrics to luxurious carpets and tapestries. The earliest known woven textiles of the Near East may be fabrics used to wrap the dead. Excavated at a Neolithic site at a cattle hoyuk in Anatolia, carbonized in a fiber and radiocarbon dating to circa 6000 BC. Evidence exists of flax cultivation from 8000 BC in the Near East, but the breeding of sheep with a woolly fleece rather than hair occurs much later circa 3000 BC. Indian textiles of the medieval era reflect Turkish, Afghan and Persian influence brought by the various conquerors that came and settled in the region during that time. The organization of crafts as a commercial activity under karkhanas or factories was established during the Delhi Sultanate period. Many textile fragments discovered at Al-Fustat in Egypt dating to 13th and 15th century are of Indian origin. They consist of block printed and resist painted textiles. The inhabitants of the Indus Valley civilization used cotton floor clothing as early as the 5th millennium BC to 4th millennium BC. According to the Columbia Encyclopedia 6th edition, cotton has been spun, woven and dyed since prehistoric times. It's clothed the people of ancient India, Egypt and China. Hundreds of years before the Christian era, Cotton textiles were woven in India with matchless skills and their use spread to the Mediterranean countries. In the first century, Arab traders brought fine muslin and calico to Italy and Spain. The Moors introduced the cultivation of cotton into Spain in the 9th century. Fustians and Dimites were woven there in the 14th century in Venice and Milan, at first with a linen warp. Little cotton cloth was imported to England before the 15th century, although small amounts were obtained chiefly for candle wicks. By the 17th century, the East India Company was bringing rare fabrics from India. Native Americans skillfully spun and wove cotton into fine garments and dyed tapestries. Cotton fabrics found in Peruvian tombs are said to belong to a pre-Inca culture. In color and texture, the ancient Peruvian and Mexican textiles resemble those found in Egyptian tombs. In Mughal India, Indian textiles, arts and crafts reached their commercial and aesthetic zenith. During the 16th and 18th century, textiles, arts and crafts such as the Kashmir shawl, fine muslins, brocades, zaris and painted and printed calicos 
referred to as chins in the English language were patronized by the Mughal royals. The end of 19th century proved to be detrimental for Indian crafts as the Indian subcontinent became a dumping ground for machine made goods from England under the colonial rule. Indian craftsmen found it difficult to compete with cheap imports from Europe and eventually this led to the establishment of factories in India. For production of linen cloth in ancient Egypt in the Neolithic period circa 5500 BC, cultivation of domesticated wild flax Probably an import from the Levant is documented as early as circa 6000 BC. Other bast fibers including rush, reed, palm and papyrus were used alone or with linen to make rope and other textiles. Evidence for wool production in Egypt is scanty at this period. Linen badges were used in the burial custom of mummification and art depicts Egyptian men wearing linen kilts and women in narrow dresses with various forms of shirts and jackets, often of sheer pleated fabric. The earliest evidence of silk production in China was found at the sites of Yangshou culture in Jia Shangji, where a cocoon of Bombax Mori, the domesticated silkworm, cut in half by a sharp knife, is dated to between 5000 to 3000 BC. Fragments of primitive looms are also seen from the sites of the Hemudu culture in Yu Yao, Zhejiang dated to about 4000 BC. Scraps of silks were found in a Liangzhu culture site in Huzhu, Zhejiang, dated back to 2700 BC. Other fragments have been recovered from royal tombs in the Shang dynasty circa 1600 to circa 1046 BC. Under the Shang dynasty, Han Chinese clothing or Han Fu consisted of a yi, a narrow cuffed knee length tunic tied with a sash and a narrow ankle length skirt called Shang, worn with a bixi, a length of fabric that reached the knees. Clothing of the elite was made of silk in vivid primary colors. The earliest evidence of spinning in Thailand can be found at the archaeological site of the Thakke located in central Thailand. Thakke was inhabited during the end of the first millennium BC to the late first millennium AD. Here, Archaeologists discovered 90 fragments of spindle wool dated from 3rd century BC to 3rd century AD and the shape of these finds indicate the connections with South China and India. A spindle wool is a disc or spherical object that fits into the spindle to increase as well as maintain the speed of spinning. The earliest evidence of weaving in Japan is associated with the Jamon period. This culture is defined by pottery decorated with cord patterns. In a shell mound in the Miyagi prefecture dating back about 5500, some cloth fragments were discovered made from the bark fibers. Hemp fibers were also discovered in the Toriham shell, Midden, Fukui prefecture dating back to the Jumon period, suggesting that these plants 
could also have been used for clothing. Some pottery pattern imprints depict also fine mat designs proving their weaving techniques. Since bone needles were also found, it is assumed that they wore dresses that were sewn together. The exchange of luxury textiles was predominant on the Silk Road, a series of ancient trade and cultural transmission routes that were central to cultural interaction through regions of the Asian continent connecting East and West by linking traders, merchants, pilgrims, monks, soldiers, nomads and urban dwellers from China to the Mediterranean Sea during various periods of time. The trade route was initiated around 114 BC by the Han dynasty, although earlier trade across the continents had already existed. Geographically, the Silk Road or the Silk Route is an interconnected series of ang'ant trade routes between Chang'an, today's Xi'an in China, with Asia Minor and the Mediterranean extending over 8,000 kilometers on land and sea. Trade on the Silk Road was a significant factor in the development of the great civilizations of China, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, the Indian subcontinent and Rome and helped to lay the foundations for the modern world. Dress in classical antiquity favored wide, unsewn lengths of fabric pinned and draped to the body in various ways. Ancient Greek clothing consisted of lengths of wool or linen, generally rectangular and secured at the shoulders with ornamented pins called fibulae and belted with a sash. Typical garments were the peplos, a loose robe worn by women, the chlamys, a cloak worn by men, and the chiton, a tunic worn by both men and women. Men's chiton hung to the knees, whereas women's chiton fell to their ankles. A long cloak called a himation was worn over the peplos or the chlamys. The toga of ancient Rome was also an unsewn length of wool cloth worn by male citizens draped around the body in various fashions over a simple tunic. Early tunics were two simple rectangles joined at the shoulder and sides. Later tunics had sewn sleeves. Women wore the draped stola or an ankle length tunic with a shawl like pala as an outer garment. Wool was the preferred fabric, although linen, hemp, and small amounts of expensive imported silk and cotton were also worn. The Iron Age is broadly identified as stretching from the end of Bronze Age around 1200 BC to 580 and the beginning of the medieval period. Bodies and clothing have been found from this period, preserved by the anaerobic and acidic conditions of peat box in the northwestern Europe. A Danish recreation of clothing found with such bodies indicates woven wool dresses, tunics and skirts. These were largely unshaped and held in place with leather belts and metal brooches or pins. Garments were not always plain, but incorporated decorations with contrasting colors, particularly at the ends and edges of the garments. Men wore breeches, possibly with lower legs wrapped for protection, although Boucher states that long trousers have also been found. 
warmth came from woolen shawls and capes of animal skins probably worn with the fur facing inwards for added comfort. Caps were worn, also made from skins and there was an emphasis on hair arrangements from braids to elaborate subian knots. Soft lace shoes made from leather protected the foot. The Byzantines made and exported very richly patterned cloth woven and embroidered for the upper classes and resins dyed and printed for the lower. By Justinian's time, the Roman toga had been replaced by the tunica or long chiton for both sexes over which the upper classes wore various other garments like dalmatica or dalmatic a heavier and shorter type of tunica, short and long cloaks were fastened on the right shoulder. Leggings and hose were often worn but are not prominent in depictions of the wealthy. They were associated with barbarians, whether Europeans or Persians. The history of medieval European clothing and textiles has inspired a good deal of scholarly interest in the 21st century. Elizabeth Crawford, Francis Pitchard and K. Staniland authored Textiles and Clothing, Medieval Finds from Excavations in London, circa 1150 to circa 1450, Boydell Press 2001. The topic is also the subject of an annual series, Medieval Clothing and Textiles by Boydell Press, edited by Robin Netherton and Professor Gail R. Owen Croker of Anglo-Saxon Culture at the University of Manchester. European dress changed gradually in the years 400 to 1100. People in many countries dressed differently depending on whether they identified with the old Romanized population or the new invading population such as Franks, Anglo-Saxon and Visigoths. Men of the invading people generally wore short tunics with belts and visible trousers, hose or leggings. The Romanized population and the church remained faithful to the longer tunics of the Roman formal costume. The elite imported silk cloth from the Byzantine and later Muslim worlds and also probably cotton. They also could afford bleached linen and dyed and simply patterned wool woven in Europe itself. But embroidered decoration was probably very widespread, though not usually detectable in art. Low classes wore local or homespun wool, often undyed, trimmed with bands of decorations, variously embroidered, tablet woven bands or colourful borders woven into the fabric in the loom. By the early Middle Ages, certain Turkish tribes were skilled in the manufacture of carpets, felted cloths, towels and rugs. In the Mughal India, 16th to 18th century and perhaps earlier, the fine muslin produced at Dhaka in Bengal were sometimes printed or painted. Despite the Muslim prohibition against representation of living things, richly patterned fabrics were made in Islamic lands. In Sicily, after the Arab conquest in 827 CE, beautiful fabrics were produced in the palace workshops at Palermo. About 1130 
skilled weavers who came to Palermo from Greece and Turkey produced elaborate fabrics of silk interlaced with gold. Following the conquest of Sicily in 1266 by the French, the weavers fled to Italy. Many settled in Lucca, which soon became well known for silk fabrics with patterns employing imaginative floral forms. In 1315, the Florentines captured Lucca, taking the Sicilian weavers to Florence, a center for fine woven woolen from about 1100 and also believed to be producing velvet at this time. A high degree of artistic and technical skill was developed with 16,000 workers employed in the silk industry and 30,000 in the woolen industry at the close of the 15th century. By the middle of the 16th century, a prosperous industry in velvets and brocades was also established in Genoa and Venice. Clothing in the 12th and 13th century Europe remained very simple for both men and women and quite uniform across the subcontinent. The traditional combination of short tunic with hose for working class men and long tunic with overgrown for women and upper class men remained the norm. Most clothing, especially outside the wealthier classes, remained little changed from three to four centuries earlier. The 13th century saw great progress in the dyeing and working of wool, which was by far the most important material for outer wear. Linen was increasingly used for clothing that was directly in contact with the skin. Unlike wool, linen could be laundered and bleached in the sun. Cotton imported raw from Egypt and elsewhere was used for padding and quilting and cloths such as buckram and fustian. The crusaders returning from the Levant brought knowledge of its fine textiles including light silks to Western Europe. In Northern Europe, silk was an imported and very expensive luxury. The Velaf could afford woven brocades from Italy or even further afield. Fashionable Italian silks of this period featured repeating patterns of roundels and animals deriving from the Ottoman silk weaving centers in Bursa and ultimately from the Yuan dynasty China via the Silk Road. Cultural and costume historians agree that the mid-14th century marks the emergence of recognizable fashion in Europe. From this century onwards, Western fashion changes at a pace quite unknown to the other civilizations, whether ancient or contemporary. In most other cultures, only major political changes such as the Muslim conquest of India produced radical changes in clothing and in China, Japan and the Ottoman Empire, fashion changed only slightly over periods of several centuries. In this period, the draped garments and straight seams of previous centuries were replaced by curved seams and the beginnings of tailoring which allowed clothing to more closely fit the human form, as did the use of lacings and buttons. A fashion for me party or party colored garments made of two contrasting fabrics, one on each side, arose for men in mid-century and was especially popular at the English court. Sometimes, Just the holes would be different colors on each leg. French manufacture of woven silks began in 1480 and in 1520, Francis I bought Italian and Flemish weavers to 
fontaine blue to produce tapestry under the direction of king's weavers others were brought to weave silk in lyon eventually the center of european silk manufacture until 1589 most of the elaborate fabrics in france were of italian origin but in that year henry iv founded the royal carpet and tapestry fabric and the savoyards flemish weavers were brought to france to produce tapestries in workshops set up by john gobelin in the 16th century by the time of king louis the 13th from 1610 to 1643 french pattern fabrics showed a distinctive style based on symmetrical ornamental forms lace like in effect perhaps derived from the highly regarded early italian laces in 1662 the french government under king louis the 14th purchased the gobelin factory in paris rouen also became known for its textiles with designs influenced by the work of rouen potters french textiles continue to advance in style and technique and under king louis the 16th design was refined with classical elements intermingled with the earlier floral patterns the outbreak of the french revolution in the 1790s erupted the work of the weavers of lyon but the industry soon recovered flanders and its neighbor arthrois were early centers of production of luxurious textiles arras for silks and velvets ghent yepres and courtrai for linen damask and arras and brussels for tapestries the damask were characterized by heraldic motifs were especially well known and linen damask of very high quality were produced in the 18th century in germany Cologne was an important medieval cloth center renowned for or fray webs which are narrow cloth of gold bearing richly embroidered woven inscriptions and figurines of saints english textiles of the 13th and 14th century were mainly of linen and wool and the trade was influenced by flemish fullers and dyers Silk was being worn in London and Norwich in 1455 and in 1564 Queen Elizabeth I granted a charter to Dutch and Flemish settlers in Norwich for production of damask and flowered silks The revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 renewing prosecution of French Protestants caused many weavers to move to England settling in Norwich Braintree and London the most important group of refugees some 3500 lived in Spitalfields a London settlement that became the chief center for fine silk damasks and brocades these weavers produced silk fabrics of high quality and were known for their subtle use of fancy weaves and textures norwich was also famous for figured shawls of silk or wool in renaissance europe wool remained the most popular fabric for all classes followed by linen and hemp woolen fabrics were also available in wide range of qualities from rough untied cloth to fine dense broadcloth with a velvety nap high value broadcloth was a backbone of the english economy and was exported throughout europe woolen fabrics were dyed in rich colors notably reds greens golds and blues silk weaving was well established around the mediterranean by the beginning of the 15th century and figured silk often silk velvets with silver gilt webs 
are increasingly seen in Italian dresses and in dress of the wealthy throughout Europe. Stately floral designs featuring a pomegranate or artichoke motif had reached Europe from China in the previous century and became a dominant design in the Ottoman silk producing cities of Istanbul and Bursa and spread to silk weavers in Florence, Genoa, Venice, Valencia and Seville in this period. As prosperity grew in the 15th century, the urban middle classes including skilled workers began to wear more complex clothes that followed at a distance the fashion set by the elites. National variations in clothing increased over the century. By the first half of the 16th century, the clothing of the Low Countries, German states and the Scandinavia had developed in a different direction than that of England, France and Italy, although all absorbed the sobering and formal influence of Spanish dress after the mid-1520s, elaborate slashing was popular especially in Germany. Black was increasingly worn for the most formal occasions. Bob and lace arose from the Passementier in the mid 16th century, probably in Flanders. This century also saw the rise of the ruff, which grew from the mare ruffle at the neckline of the shirt or chemise to immense cartwheel shapes. At their most extravagant, ruffs required wire supports and were made of fine Italian reticilla a cutwork linen lace. By the turn of the 17th century, a sharp distinction could be seen between the sober fashions favoured by the Protestants in England and the Netherlands, which still showed heavy Spanish influence and the light revealing fashions of the French and Italian courts. The great flowering of needle lace occurred in this period Geometric reticella deriving from cutwork was elaborated into true needle lace or punto in aria called in England as point lace which reflected the scrolling floral designs popular for embroidery. Lace making centers were established in France to reduce the outflow of cash to Italy. According to Dr. Wolf de Furig, by the second half of the 17th century, Silesia had become an important economic pillar of the Habsburg monarchy, largely on the strength of its textile industry. During the 18th century, distinction was made between full dress worn at court and for formal occasions and undress for everyday daytime clothes. As the decades progressed, fewer and fewer occasions called for full dress, which had all but disappeared by the end of the century. Full dress followed the styles of the French court, where rich silks and elaborate embroidery reigned. Men continued to wear the coat, waistcoat and breeches for both full dress and undress. These were now sometimes made of the same fabric and trim, signalling the birth of the three-piece suit. Women's silhouettes featured small, domed hoops in the 1730s and early 1740s, which were displaced for formal court wear by side hoops or panniers, which later widened to as much as three feet to either side at the court of Mary Antoinette. Fashion reached heights of fantasy and abundant ornamentation before new enthusiasms for outdoor sports and country pursuits and long simmering movement towards simplicity and democratization of dress under the influence of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the American Revolution.
This led to an entirely new mode and the triumph of British woolen tailoring following the French Revolution. For women's dresses, Indian cottons, specially printed chins, were imported to Europe in large numbers and towards the end of the period, simple white muslin gowns were in fashion. Weaving and dyeing were established in the New World before arrival of the Europeans. Weaving was in an advanced state in North and South America during prehistoric times. Both the Peruvians and the Mexicans had fine woven fabrics. The Peruvian fabrics were much like those of ancient Egypt, although contact between the two civilizations is generally considered unlikely. Inca cotton and wool fabrics were brilliantly colored with patterns based on geometric and conventionalized human forms. Fabrics, especially blankets made by the Navajo of Arizona in New Mexico had especially close texture and brilliant color. English settlers established a cloth mill in Massachusetts in 1638. There, Yorkshire weavers produced heavy cotton fustians, cotton twill jeans, and lince woolsey, a coarse loosely woven fabric of linen and wool. The fulling mills were operating in Massachusetts by 1654 freeing the community from dependence on England for fine linen and worsted. The industry developed steadily and received a major impetus from the Ellie Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in 1793. The Industrial Revolution was a revolution of textiles technology. The cotton gin, the spinning jenny, and the power loom mechanized production and led to the Luddite Rebellion. The textile industry, although highly developed as a craft, remained essentially a cottage industry until the 18th century. The advantages of cooperative operations were however realized much earlier and more number of workers occasionally operated together under one roof where one such group was operating a mill in Zurich in 1568 and another in Derby, England in 1717. Factory organization became most advanced in the north of England and the Industrial Revolution at its height between 1760 and 1815 greatly accelerated the growth of the mill system. John Kay's flying shuttle invented in 1733 increased the speed of the weaving operation and its success created pressure for more rapid spinning of yarn to feed the faster looms. Mechanical spinners produced in 1769 and 1779 by Sir Richard Arkwright and Samuel Crompton encouraged development of mechanized processes of carding and combing wool for the spinning machines. Soon after the turn of the century, the first power loom was developed. The replacement of water power by steam power increased the speed of power-driven machinery and the factory system became firmly established, first in England, later in Europe and the United States. During the Industrial Revolution, Fabric production was mechanized with machines powered by water wheels and steam engines. Production shifted from small cottage-based production 
to mass production based on assembly line organization. Clothing production, on the other hand, continued to be made by hand. Sewing machines emerged in the 19th century streamlining clothing production. In the early 20th century, workers in the clothing and textile industries formed unions. Later in the 20th century, the industry had expanded to such a degree that such educational institutions as UC Davis established a division of textiles and clothing, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln also created a department of textiles, clothing and design that offers a Masters of Arts in textile history and Iowa State University established a department of textiles and clothing that features a history of costume collection from 1865 to 1948. Even high school libraries have collections on the history of clothing and textiles. Alongside these developments, there were changes in the types and styles of clothing produced. During the 1960s, it had a major influence on subsequent developments in the industry. Textiles were not only made in factories, before this, they were also made in local and national markets. Dramatic changes in transportation throughout the nation is one source that encouraged the use of factories. New advances such as steamboats, canals and railroads lowered shipping costs which caused people to buy cheaper goods that were produced in other places instead of more expensive goods that were produced locally. Between 1810 and 1840, the development of a national market prompted manufacturing which tripled the output's growth. This increase in production created a change in industrial methods such as the use of factories instead of handmade woven materials that families usually made. The vast majority of the people who worked in these factories were women. Women went to work in textile factories for a number of reasons. Some women left home to live on their own because of crowding at home or to save for future marriage portions. The work enabled them to see more of the world, to earn something in anticipation of marriage and to ease the crowding within the home. They also did it to make money for family back home. The money they sent home was to help out with the trouble some of the farmers were having. The Industrial Revolution brought uniformity to production as everything was being mass produced and arts and crafts seemed to have taken a backseat. In response, a regeneration of interest in arts and crafts was initiated. This was called the Arts and Crafts Movement, an aesthetic movement of the second half of the 19th century which represented the beginning of a new appreciation of the decorative arts throughout the Europe. A prominent figure of this movement was an English designer, William Morris, who in 1861 founded a firm of interior decorators and manufacturers, Morris, Marshall and Faulkner and Company. Renamed as Morris and Company in 1875, and this firm dedicated itself to recapture the spirit and quality of medieval craftsmanship. To this date, many of the company's designs provide a source of inspiration 
for textile designers and furniture manufacturers worldwide. The word loom from Middle English loom or tool is applied to any set of devices permitting a warp to be tensioned and a shed to be formed. Looms exist in great variety from the bundles of cords and rods of primitive people to enormous machines of steel and cast iron. Except on certain experimental looms, the warp shed is formed with the aid of heels. Usually one heel is provided for each end or multiple ends of warp threads, but on some primitive looms, simple cloths are produced with heels provided only for each alternate end. A heel consists of a short length of cord, wire or flat steel strip. A heel consists of a short length of cord wire or flat steel strip supported in its operative position perpendicular to the sheet of warp threads and is provided with an eyelet at its midpoint through which the warp end is threaded. By pulling one end of the heel or the other, the warp end can be deflected to top or bottom of the main sheet of ends. The frame holding the heels is called a harness. In most looms, the weft is supplied from a shuttle, a hollow projectile inside which a weft package is mounted in such a way that the weft can be freely unwound through an eyelet leading from inside to the outside. The shuttle enters the shed and transverses the warp leaving a trail of weft behind. Beating in is generally effected by means of a grating of uniformly spaced fine parallel wires originally made of natural reeds and thus called a reed which mounted at right angle to the warp oscillates between the heel and the junction of the warp and the cloth. The ends pass one or more at a time through the spaces between the consecutive reed wires so that the reed in addition to beating in controls the spacing of the end in the cloth. By about 2500 BCE, a more advanced loom was apparently evolving in East Asia. Fragments of silk fabrics found adhering to bronzes of Shang or Yin period 18 to 12th century in China show traces of twill damask pattern suggesting an advanced weaving knowledge since such fabrics could not practicably be woven on the looms described above. These fabrics were probably produced on a horizontal frame loom with treadles. The logical connecting link between the horizontal two bar and the horizontal frame loom with treadles would have been a loom with a heel rod that was controlled by one foot for which no early illustrations have been found. The earliest European pictorial record of the horizontal frame loom with a treadle dates from the 13th century when it appears in a highly developed form, almost certainly introduced from the east. This two bar loom was mounted on a frame and to this was connected a treadle operated by the feet by moving the heels. This was an improvement of the heel rod or cord controls which was mounted between bars and called a shaft. The advantages of this type of loom were many. First, in the two bar loom, though more than two heel rods could be used, the number of groupings or warp threads was limited. Although highly complex patterns could be woven, it was not practical to do so for producing very small quantities of cloth. The shaft loom allowed as many as 24 shafts to be set up easily, enabling the weaver to produce comparatively intricate patterns. The second weaver's comb 
formerly used to beat the weft into place was replaced by the batten supported in a heavy wooden frame for the main frame of the loom. Its weight and free singing motion improved the ease of beating in action. Thirdly, the use of the foot treadle freed both hands to throw the shuttle and swing the batten. The loom remained virtually unchanged for many centuries thereafter. The shaft loom was adequate for plain and for simply patterned fabrics, but a more complex loom was needed for the weaving of intricately figured fabrics, which might require hundred or more shafts. This kind of weaving was accomplished on the draw loom. Its origin is unknown but probably was first used in East Asia for silk weaving and was introduced into the silk working centers of Italy during the Middle Ages. The draw loom had two devices for shedding in addition to the shafts which the weaver operated by treadles, cords were also used to raise the warp threads gathered into groups as required by the pattern. The cords were worked by an operator called a draw boy, seats it on top of the loom. The draw loom was improved in Italy and France in the early 17th century by the addition of a type of mechanical draw boy allowing the assistant to stand on the floor at the side of the loom and increasing the control of the cords. The continued inconvenience of employing an assistant, however, who might also make errors led to a search for an automatic mechanism that would perform all the work of the draw boy. Most of the later developments in automatic mechanisms to control the shedding operation originated in France, which had become one of the leading countries in the weaving of figure silks. In 1725, Bessel Bouchon, added to the mechanical draw boy a mechanism that selected the cords to be drawn to form the pattern. Selection was controlled by a roll of paper perforated according to the pattern which passed around a cylinder. The cylinder was pushed towards the selecting box and met with needles carrying the warp controlling cords. The needles that met one perforated paper slid along and the others pass through the holes and remain stationary. The selected cords were drawn down by a foot operated treadle. The mechanical draw boy made the proper selection of warp threads eliminating errors but still required an operator. The mechanism was improved in 1728 by increasing the number of needles and using a rectangular perforated card for each individual shedding motion, the cards being strung together in an endless chain. In 1745, Jacques de Vucasha constructed a loom incorporating a number of improvements. He mounted the selecting box above the loom where it acted directly on hooks fastened to the cords that control the warp yarns. The hooks passed through the needles and were raised by a strong metal bar. The needles were selected by perforated cards passing around a sliding cylinder without the aid of a second operator or assistant. The cylinder was very complex and the mechanism is not known to have been adopted but it served as the foundation for the successful jacquard attachment. The French inventor Joseph Marie Jacquard, commissioned to overhaul Vukasa's loom, did so without the directions which were missing. In 1801, at the Paris Industrial Exhibition, he demonstrated an improved draw loom. In 1804 to 05, he introduced the invention that ever since had caused the loom to which it is attached to be called the jacquard loom. The jacquard attachment 
is an automatic selecting shedding device that is mounted on top of the loom and operated by a treadle controlled by the weaver. As in the draw loom, every warp yarn runs through a loop in a controlling cord held taut by a weight. Each cord is suspended from a wire or hook that is bent at the bottom to hold the cord and bent at the top in order to hook around the blades or bars or the griff, the lifting mechanism to allow only these warp threads that are needed to form the pattern to be raised, some hooks must be dislodged from the rising griff. This is accomplished by horizontally placed needles connected to the hooks. As the perforated pattern card moves into place on the cylinder, the needles pass through the holes in the card and the warps are raised. Where there are no holes, the needles are pushed back by a spring action on the opposite end of each, pulling the hooks away from the rising griff bar and the warps are not raised. Each card represents one throw of the shuttle and the pattern is transferred to the cards from the designer's weave draft. Although each a card attachment is limited in the number of hooks it can control and therefore in the size of the repeat pattern, several jacquard attachments can be added to one loom so that the weaver not only can produce intricately figured fabrics but also can weave pictures of considerable size. The first decisive step towards automation of the loom was the invention of the flying shuttle patented in 1733 by the Englishman John Kay. Kay was a weaver of broadloom fabrics which because of their width required two weavers to sit side by side, one throwing the shuttle from the right to the center and the other reaching between the warps and sending it on its way to the left and then returning it to the center. The stopping of the shuttle and the reaching between the warps caused imperfections in the cloth. K devised a mechanical attachment controlled by a cord jerked by the weaver that sent the shuttle flying through the shed. Jerking the cord in the opposite direction sent the shuttle on its return trip. Using the flying shuttle, one weaver could weave fabrics of any width more quickly than two could before. A more important virtue of Kay's invention, however, lay in its adaptability to automatic weaving. Fibers are units of matter having length at least 100 times their diameter or width. Fibers suitable for textile use possesses adequate length, finesse, strength and flexibility for yarn formation and fabric construction and for withstanding the intended use of the completed fabric. Other properties affecting textile fiber performance include elasticity, crimp, moisture absorption, reaction to heat and sunlight, reaction to various chemicals applied during processing and in the dry cleaning or laundering of the completed fabric and resistant to insects and microorganisms. The wide variation of such properties among textile fibers determines their suitability for various uses. The first fibers available for textile use were obtained from plant and animal sources. Over a long period of experimentation with the many natural fibers available, cotton, wool, jute, flax, and silk became recognized as the most satisfactory. The commercial development of man-made fibers 
began late in the 19th century, experienced much growth during the 1940s, expanded rapidly after World War II, and is still the subject of extensive research and development. This group includes regenerated fibers such as rayon made from fiber forming materials already existing in the nature and manipulated into fibrous form and synthetic fibers with the fibers forming substance produced from chemicals derived from such sources as coal and oil and then made into such fibers as nylon and polyesters. Because filaments such as silk and the man-made fibers have extreme length, they can be made into yarn without the spinning operation necessary for the shorter staple fibers. When grouped together in a loose continuous rope without twist, man-made filaments are called tow. Filaments may be loosely twisted together to form yarns of a specified thickness. Staple fibers such as cotton only a few inches long must be tightly twisted together to produce satisfactory length. Filament yarns are usually thin, smooth and luscious. Staple yarns are usually thicker, fibrous and without luster. Man-made filaments cut to a predetermined short length become staple fibers usually described by combining the fiber name with the term staple as in rayon staple. In modern mills, most fiber processing operations are performed by mechanical means. Such natural fibers as cotton arriving in bales and wool arriving as fleece are treated at the mill to remove various foreign materials such as twigs and burrs. Wool must also be treated to remove swind or wool grease. Silk must be treated to remove sericin, a gum from the cocoon and the very short silk fibers of waste silk. Raw linen, the fiber of flax, is separated from most impurities before delivery. Man-made fibers, since they are produced by factory operations, rarely contain foreign materials. Blending, as frequently employed for natural fibers, involves mixing fibers taken from different lots to obtain uniform length, diameter, density and moisture content, thus assuring production of a uniform yarn. Blending is also employed when different fibers are combined to produce yarn. Man-made fibers which can be cut into uniform toe do not require blending unless they are to be mixed with other fibers. Cotton, wool, waste silk and man-made staple are subjected to carding, a process of separating individual fibers and causing many of them to lie parallel and also removing most of the remaining impurities. Carding produces a thin sheet of uniform thickness that is then condensed to form a thick, continuous, untwisted strand called sliver. When very fine yarns are desired, carding is followed by combing, a process that removes short fibers, leaving a sliver composed entirely of long fibers, all laid parallel and both smoother and more lustrous than uncombed types. Slivers may be loosely twisted together, forming roving, hackling, a process applied to straighten and separate flax is similar to combing. Spinning is the process of drying out and twisting fibers to join them firmly together in a continuous thread or yarn. Spinning is an indispensable preliminary to weaving cloth from those fibers that do not have extreme length. 
From early times through the Middle Ages, spinning was accomplished with the use of two implements, the die stuff and the spindle. The die stuff was a stick on which the mass of fiber was held. The drawn out length of the fiber was fastened to the weighted spindle which hung free. The spinner whirled the spindle causing it to twist the fiber as it was drawn from the die stuff. As a length was drawn out, the operation was halted. The new yarn wound on the spindle and secured by a notch and the operation was repeated. The spinning wheel invented in India and introduced to Europe in the Middle Ages mechanized the process, the spinning of the wheel, supplanted the whirl of the weighted spindle and after each operation the spinner wound the new yarn on the spindle. This was accomplished simply and speedily by holding the yarn outstretched with one hand and feeding it as the wheel was spun in the reverse direction. An important advantage conferred by the spinning wheel was the fact that it tended to add more twist at thin places in the forming yarn and to draw out the thicker places giving a more uniform yarn. The spinning wheel continued in the use into the 19th century receiving an important improvement in the 16th century in the form of Saxony wheel which made possible continuous spinning of coarse wool and cotton yarn. With this improvement in speed, 3 to 5 spinning wheels could supply one loom with yarn, but with K's flying shuttle greatly increased the output of the loom and created a demand for spinning machinery. James Hargreaves spinning jenny, painted in 1770, operated a number of spindles simultaneously but was suitable only for making yarn used as filling. Sir Richard Arkwright, making use of earlier inventions, produced a better machine capable of making stronger yarn than Hargreaves Jenny. Still, a third machine, Samuel Crompton's Mule, in 1779, vastly increased productivity, making it possible for a single operator to work more than 1,000 spindles simultaneously and it was capable of spinning fine as well as coarse yarns. Several further modifications were introduced in Britain and the United States, but the Crompton Mule effectively put yarn spinning on a mass production basis. In modern spinning, slivers or rovings are fed into machine with rollers that draw out these strands, making them longer and thinner, and spindles that insert the amount of twist necessary to hold the fibers together. Tightness of the twist determines the strength of the yarn, although too much twist may eventually cause weakening and breakage. When the spirals formed by twisted yarns are similar in slope to the central position of the letter Z, the yarns are described as Z-twist. When the spirals conform in the direction to the central position of the letter S, the yarns are described as Z-twist. The spinning process is completed by winding the yarns on spools or bobbins. Reeling is the process of unwinding raw silk filament from the cocoon directly onto a holder. When several filament strands, either raw silk or man-made, are combined and twisted together, producing yarn of a specified thickness, the process is called throwing. Yarn measurements are expressed as yarn number, count or size and describe the relationship of length and weight or approximate diameter. Because methods of measurement are developed in various areas of the world, 
there has been a lack of uniformity in such systems. Indirect measuring system are those employing higher number to describe finer yarns and are based on length per unit weight. A widely used continental system is based on the number of hangs of 1000 meters required to reach a weight of 1 kilogram. The Denier system is a direct management type employed internationally to measure the size of silk and man-made filaments and yarns and derived from an earlier system for measuring silk filaments based on the weight in drams of 1000 yards. Denier number indicates the weight of grams of 9000 meters of filament of filament yarn. Thus, a smaller number indicates a finer yarn. This system is not convenient for measurement of staple yarns because their greater weight would require the use of very large numbers. The text system originally devised in 1873 is a universal method developed for the measurement of staple fiber yarns and is also applicable to the measurement of filament yarns. It is based on the weight of grams of 1 kilometer of yarn. Yarn is a strand composed of fibers, filaments, individual fibers of extreme length or other material, either natural or man-made, suitable for use in the construction of interlaced fabrics such as woven or knitted types. The strand may consist of a number of fibers twisted together, a number of filaments grouped together but not twisted, a number of filaments twisted together, a single filament called a monofilament, either with or without twist or one or more strips made by dividing a sheet of material such as paper or metal foil and either twisted or untwisted. The properties of the yarn employed greatly influence the appearance, texture and performance of the completed fabric. The intended use of a yarn usually determines the packaging method employed bobbins of wood, cardboard or plastic cores on which yarns are wound as they are spun and they have holes in their centers allowing them to fit on spindles or other holding devices. Spools are cylindrical with end flanges. Cones have a conical shaped core, produce a package of conical shape, tubes with cylindrical shaped cores, produce cylindrical packages. Cheeses are cylindrical yarn packages wound on a tube and unlike most other packages, they have greater diameter than height. Skeins are coil of yarns wound with no supporting core. Prints are large barrel shaped packages used to hold the weft or filling yarn supply for the shuttle in weaving. Quills are small tapered tubes holding the weft yarns for weaving. Beams are wood or metal cylinders about 5 feet long and up to 10 inches in diameter on which yarns used as warp in weaving are wound. Yarns can be described as single or one ply, ply, plied or folded or as cord including cable and hosser types. Single or one ply Yarns are single strands composed of fibers held together by at least a small amount of twist or of filaments grouped together either with or without twist or of narrow strips of material or of single man-made filaments extruded in sufficient thickness for use alone as yarn or monofilaments. Single yarns of the spun type composed of many short fibers require twists to hold them together and may be made with either S-twist or Z-twist. Single yarns are used to make the greatest variety of fabrics. Ply, plied 
or folded yarns are composed of two or more single yarns twisted together. Two ply yarn, for example, is composed of two single strands. Three ply yarn is composed of three single strands. In making ply yarns from spun strands, the individual strands are usually twisted in one direction, are then combined and twisted in the opposite direction. Both the single strands and the final ply yarns are twisted in the same direction. The fiber is firmer, producing harder texture and reducing flexibility. Ply yarns provide strength for heavy industrial fabrics and are also used for delicate looking sheer fabrics. Corded yarns are produced by twisting ply yarn together with the final twist usually applied in the opposite direction of the ply twist. Cable cords may follow an SZS form with an S twisted singles made into Z twisted piles that are then combined with an S twist or may follow an ZSZ form. Horse cord may follow an SSZ or a ZZS pattern. Corded yarns may be used as rope or twine, may be made into very heavy industrial fabrics or may be composed of extremely fine fibers that are made up into sheer dress fabrics. Novelty yarns include a wide variety of yarns made with such special effects as slubs produced by intentionally including small lumps in the yarn structure and man-made yarns with varying thickness introduced during production. Natural fibers including some linens, wools to be woven into tweed and the uneven filaments of some types of silk cloth are allowed to retain their normal irregularities producing the characteristics uneven surface of the finished fabric. Man-made fibers which can be modified during production are especially adaptable for special effects such as crimping and texturizing. Texturizing processes were originally applied to man-made fibers to reduce such characteristics as transparency, slipperiness and the possibility of pilling which is formation of small fiber tangles on a fabric surface. Texturizing processes make yarns more opaque, improve appearance and texture and increase warmth and absorbency. Textured yarns are man-made continuous filaments modified to impart special texture and appearance. In the production of a braided yarns, the surface are roughened are cut at various intervals and given added twists producing a hairy effect. Stretch yarns are frequently continuous filament man-made yarns that are very highly twisted, heat set and then untwisted producing a spiral crimp giving a springy character. Although bulk is imported in the process, a very high amount of twist is required to produce yarn that has not only bulk but also stretch. Spandex is the generic term for a highly elastic synthetic fiber composed mainly of segmented polyurethane. Metallic yarns are usually man-made from strips of a synthetic film such as polyester coated with metallic particles. In another method, aluminum foil strips are sandwiched between layers of film. Metallic yarns may also be made by twisting a strip of metal around a natural or man-made core yarn producing a metal surface. Almost any textile yarn can be used to produce such interlaced fabrics as woven and knitted types. In weaving, the warp or lengthwise, yarns are subjected to greater stress and are usually stronger smoother and more even and have tighter twists than the weft or crosswise yarns. A sizing or stiffening material such as starch may be applied to warp yarns increasing the strength 
to withstand the stresses of fabric construction operation. Weft yarns subjected to little stress during weaving may be quite fragile. Warp and weft threads used in the same fabric may be of different diameter producing such special effects as ribbing or cording in the fabric. Special effects may also be obtained by combining warp and weft yarns of fibers from different origin or with different degrees of twist or by introducing metallic threads into weaves composed of other fibers. Yarns for machine knitting are usually loosely twisted because softness is desired in knit fabrics. Yarns used in hand knitting are generally of two or more ply. They include such types of fingering yarns usually of two or three plies, light to medium in weight and with even diameter. They are used for various types of apparel, German town yarns, soft and thick, usually four ply and of medium weight, frequently used for sweaters and blankets. Shetland yarns are fine, soft, fluffy and lightweight, frequently two plied, used for infants and children's sweaters and for shawls. Worsted knitting yarns are highly twisted and heavy, differing from worsted fabrics by being soft instead of crisp and are suitable for sweaters. And zephyr yarns are either all wool or wool blended with other fibers, are very fine and soft with low twist and are used for lightweight garments. Embroidery floss used in hand embroidery generally has low twist, is of the ply or cord type and is made of such smooth filaments as silk and rayon. Yarns used for crocheting is frequently loose cotton cord type and darning yarns are usually loosely spun yarns. Fabric construction involves the conversion of yarns and sometimes fibers into a fabric having characteristics determined by the materials and methods employed. Most fabrics are presently produced by some method of interlacing such as weaving or knitting. Weaving is currently the major method of fabric production, includes the basic weaves, plain or tabby, twill and satin and the fancy weaves including pile, jacquard, dobby and gauze. Weaving is a textile production method which involves interlacing a set of longer threads called the warp with a set of crossing threads called the weft. This is done on a frame or machine known as loom of which there are a number of types. Some weaving is still done by hand, but the vast majority is mechanized. Knitting and crocheting involve interlacing loops of yarns, which are formed either on a knitting needle or on a crochet hook together in a line. The two processes are different in which knitting has several active loops at any given time on the knitting needle waiting to interlock with another loop while crocheting has one active loop on the needle. Knitted fabrics are rapidly increasing in importance and include weft types and the warp types, rachel and tricot. The popularity of handmade laces led to the invention of lace making machines. The early models require intricate engineering mechanisms and the development of the modern lace industry originated when a machine was designed to produce laces identical with Brussels lace. In the Heathcote or bobbin net, 
machine warp threads are arranged so that the threads moved downwards as the beams unwound. Other threads were wound on thin, flat spools or bobbins held in narrow carriages that could move in a groove or comb in two rows. The carriages carrying the bobbins were placed on one side of the vertical warp threads and given a pendulum-like motion causing them to pass between the warp threads. The warp threads were then moved sideways so that on the return swing each bobbin thread passed around one of them. Then the warp threads moved sideways in the opposite direction thus completing a warping movement. In addition, each row of bobbins was moved by a rack and pinion gearing, one row to the left and one to the right. As these movements continued, the threads were laid diagonally across the fabric as the warp was delivered. Improvements on the Heathcote machine followed through the 19th century. Nottingham lace machines, used primarily for coarse lace production, employ larger bobbins and the pattern threads are wound independently on section spools. In another type, which is the Barman's machine, threads on King's bobbins on carriers and are plated together, sometimes with warp threads. Sheafly lace, which is a type of embroidery, is made by modern machines evolved from a hand version using needles with points at each end. Several hundred needles are placed horizontally, often in two rows, one above the other. The fabric to be embroidered is held vertically in a frame extending the full width of the machine and the needles supplied with yarn from individual spools move backwards and forward through the fabric. At each penetration, a shuttle moves upwards and interlaces yarn with the needle loop. Movement of both fabric and needles is controlled by jacquard systems. Many types of machine-made laces are made, frequently with geometrical shaped nets forming their backgrounds. Formerly made only of cotton, they are now frequently made from man-made fiber yarns. Bobinet lace is essentially a hexagonal net which is used as a base for applique work for durable non-run net hoisery and when heavily sized for such materials as millinery and veilings. Barman's lace has a fairly heavy texture and an angular pattern flowing lines, heavy outline cords, and fine net backgrounds are not usually made of Barman's machines. The introduction of light resistant polyester yarns led to a revival of Nottingham machine made curtains. Lever's lace is available in an infinite variety of patterns since the manufacturing technique allows uses of almost any type of yarn. The high strength and comparatively low cost of man-made fiber yarns has made sheer laces widely available. Net is an open fabric having geometrically shaped open meshes which is produced with meshes ranging from fine to large. Formerly these were made by hand. The various types are now made on knitting machines. The popular types include bobinet, which is made with hexagonal shaped mesh and used for formal gowns, veils and curtains. And tulle is a closely constructed fine net having similar uses. Fishnet is a coarse type with knots in four corners forming the mesh formerly made by fishermen is now a popular machine made curtain fabric. Spread toe is a production method where the yarn are spread into thin tapes and then the tapes are woven as warp and weft. This method is mostly used for composite materials. Spread toe fabrics 
can be made with carbon, aramide, etc. Braids are made by interlacing three or more yarns of fabric strips, forming a flat or tubular narrow fabric. It is used as trimmings and for belts and is also sewn together to make hats and braided rugs. Plating is usually used synonymously with braiding, may be used in a more limited sense applying only to a braid made from such materials as rope and straw. Knotting involves tying threads together and is used in making macrame. Lace is made by interlocking threads together independently using a backing and any of the methods described above to create a fine fabric with open holes in the work. Lace can be made by either hand or machine. Carpets, rugs, velvet, velour and velveteen are made by interlacing a secondary yarn through woven cloth creating a tufted layer known as a nap or pile. With the exception of felt, non-woven materials are in the early stages of development. There is controversy about the precise meaning of the term non-woven but one authority defines non-woven fabrics as textile fabrics made of a fibrous layers having randomly laid or oriented fibers or threads. Non-woven fabrics are gaining importance and include materials produced by felting and bonding. Bark cloth is made by pounding bark until it is soft and flat. Felts are a class of fabrics of fibrous structures obtained through the interlocking of wool, fur or some hair fibers under conditions of heat, moisture and pressure. Other fibers will not felt alone but can be mixed with wool which acts as a carrier. There would be three separate industries manufacturing goods through the use of these properties. The goods produced are wool felt in rolls and sheets, hats produced both in fur and wool and woven felts which are ranging from thin billiard tablecloths to heavy industrial fabrics used for dewatering in the manufacture of paper. Felts of the non-woven class are considered to be the first textile goods produced and many references may be found to felts and their uses in the histories of ancient civilizations. The nomadic tribes of North Central Asia still produce felts for clothing and shelter utilizing the primitive methods handed down from antiquity.